In this video, I am talking about the difference between real and ideal voltmeters and ammeters. I'm also going to go through some calculations about why it may make a difference. This is part of topic 5.2 of the IB Physics syllabus. It is relevant for both higher level and standard level students. You can see I just have one success criteria for this video, being able to solve some problems involving both ideal and non-ideal voltmeters and nanometers, and knowing what that really means. So just a quick reminder of actually where we need to put voltmeters and ammeters in our circuit. I have a simple circuit here, and I've connected both an ammeter right here. You can see, remember, ammeters is going to measure the current which means I need to know about the flow of electrons, and that means I need the electrons to flow through my actual ammeter. That's connected in series. But the voltmeter is going to be measuring the potential difference, or the voltage. That means I need to know what the potential is before and after my component. So you can see here that I've got before and after the resistor. That means it's going to be connected in parallel. Now, as soon as I have this current flowing through my ammeter, we know from before that if I have two resistors, that means I really have these two things connected in series. If I do that and I add resistance in series, that would add the two values together. So if I have any resistance here in my ammeter, I've actually changed my circuit. So for that reason, ideal ammeters will need to have minimal resistance. But, if I have my electrons going through here, I want to know what the difference is with the energy of the electrons before and after my resistor. That means if I have any current flowing through my voltmeter, again, I'm going to change the amount of current and I will change my circuit. So for that reason, because voltmeters are connected in parallel, we want them to have a infinite resistance so that no current actually goes this direction and all of my current continues to go through my resistor. Okay, so let's go through and do an example of what would happen if we have a voltmeter that's not going to be with an infinite resistance. Now, if I didn't have that voltmeter there at all, we can see that my two resistors are exactly the same, which means this would have a potential difference of 4.5 volts, and so would this one. But as soon as I have this one, this voltmeter here with a non-infinite resistance, now I actually have these two pieces that are going to be in parallel. Now if you recall how I have to calculate this, I need to use 1 over R total is going to be 1 over each of the individual resistors. If you remember, when you put two things in parallel, the total effective resistance actually decreases. And if I go through and do the math, it gives me 667 ohms is the effective resistance of these two pieces. So now let's go and calculate what kind of current would be flowing through this circuit. First, let me calculate what the current would be. So if I use my ohm's law for the total circuit, my total potential difference here is 9. The total current is what I'm looking for. And the total resistance will be just these two added in series the 1 kilo ohm plus the effective resistance of these two, and I put that in and I get a current of 5.4 milliamps. Now let's think about what that's done. If I go and I look at my first uh, resistor here, we know that the potential difference is going to be the current times its resistance, and now I know that the current coming to it is going to be 5.4 times 10 to the minus 3, times the 1 times 10 to the power of 3. That means right here, this is going to be 5.4 volts. Now you remember, if there was no voltmeter there, or it was a voltmeter ideal and it had an infinite resistance, then both resistors were receiving 4.5 volts, because they had exactly the same resistance. In this case now, the second part here has decreased in its effective resistance, which means it's going to be getting less of the share of the 9 volts than it was before. And so now I've got 5.4 volts here, and this one's only going to get 3.6.
So as soon as we have a voltmeter that doesn't have infinite resistance, we actually do then affect the values in our circuit. Now, the reason why it made a big change in this case is because the voltmeter was close to the resistance of the resistor that's there. If I had a very large difference, so if I did this exact same equ question, but instead of us having 2 kilo ohms, let's say I had 1 giga ohm. Let me go through the values again, and I'll show you what kind of difference it makes. Well, you can go through and calculate the effective resistance of the two of them. And the effective resistance is now 99.99.9. You get the picture. It's almost the same as what it was. What that would do is then calculate my current to be 0 0.00045 amps, which you can see that this is going to be 4.5 milliamps. And when I put it in my calculations a little later, it's going to give me a voltage across that first resistor of basically 4.5 volts again. And so it really hasn't made a difference. So what I need to, even if it's not perfect, is I have to have a substantially higher resistance of my voltmeter in comparison to the resistor I'm using in order for us to be able to ignore whether or not it's a real voltmeter or an ideal voltmeter. Just make sure that you read the questions in case the question involves a real voltmeter, not ideal. So let's go through and calculate to see what would have happened if our ammeter was not an ideal one and it actually had a value for a resistance. First of all, since these are all in series, nice and easy to calculate the total or the effective resistance of these three pieces. If I put that into Ohm's Law and I do my calculation, I get a current of 0 0.86 amps. Now, if that ammeter had been ideal, in other words, it had zero resistance, then my total resistance would have been only 60. If I would have put that in my Ohm's Law, I would get 6 over 60, which gives me 0 0.1 amps. So again, you can see in this case, it would make a difference. Now, I could go through the calculations, and as long as my ammeter is substantially lower in resistance than the resistors in the circuit, then I won't have to make that distinction. But always keep an eye open on the questions in case it does make a difference, and you cannot assume that the ammeter is not an ideal ammeter. Okay, so let's think about some of these questions um, about how to use ammeters and voltmeters in circuits. So we've got a circuit here. You can see there's an ammeter, and then we have two parallel um, branches here, and there's a switch on one of them that's currently open. The question asks, when the switch is closed, what will describe to happen to the current and the potential difference? Well, let's first think about what's actually happening here when this is closed. There's nothing on this branch of the circuit. So as soon as I close this, I'm effectively creating a short circuit across this resistor. So the current's going to come here, and it's not going to go this direction. It's going to go this way. If it does go in this direction, it's going to be very small compared to here. So I've got two things now in parallel and I've made it so much easier. So let's think about that. Two things in parallel, the resistance, effective resistance of those two pieces always goes down, and in this case it's going to go almost to zero because we usually assume a wire has no resistance. So in my complete circuit, I now have less resistance, which means my current is going to go up. So let's block off, not that one, not that one. So our answer is going to be B or C. So now let's think about what's going to happen to our actual potential difference. If I'm not really getting any electrons flowing through here, if I don't really have any current, then I really am not going to have any potential difference across it as well. Another thing to think about is in parallel, this branch and this branch is going to end up having the same potential difference. And if we have a wire that's perfect, there shouldn't be any potential difference from one side to the other. So this value actually should go and decrease to zero. So our answer is B. 
So here's another question about the placement of ammeters and voltmeters. Two 6 ohm resistors are connected in series with the 6 volt cell. A student incorrectly and notice they have underlined that, sorry, made it bold for you, connect them improperly. My ammeter here is connected in parallel and the voltmeter is in series. Remember, incorrect. So let's see what's going to happen. Now you might be tempted to say, hey, right here, this ammeter, if it's an ideal ammeter, it has no resistance. So all the current is going to go through here and we're going to get the current being um, equivalent to a circuit that has six ohms, six volts, and that should give me a current of one amp. And then start thinking about the voltmeter. But you would have been falling into the trap you really should think of the voltmeter first, because remember, a voltmeter has an infinitely high resistance. And if that's the case, there's not going to be any current flowing at all. So no current will be flowing at all. Now, let's think about what the voltmeter is actually going to be reading. One side's connected here to the negative side. The other, even though there is no current flowing, well, it's really actually just connected to the other side of the cell. Take a look again. This side is connected over here. It doesn't matter which branch you use. So my voltmeter is actually going to read six volts. And my answer here is B. Well, only one success criteria, but I hope given those numerical examples, have helped you be able to solve problems involving both ideal and non-ideal voltmeters and ammeters.